burnt our hearts on fire When we were listening to you speak We have heard and we believe And now our eyes sent higher We are listening to you speak Fullness of life we have received
washing over me.
face presence go before you and beside you and behind you all around you and within you he's with you he's with you in your coming and your going and your coming and your going and you waiting and rejoicing he's for you Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Online. We're so glad that you could join us uh, today. Hope you're doing well and enjoying uh, the back to school rush and uh, a little bit of normalcy after a lovely summer. It's great to be back. I had a lovely week away. Thank you, uh, everybody, for holding down the fort. Uh, a couple announcements to roll through. Uh, the first is that October 3rd, we are hosting a Sunday a uh, special Sunday service because it is the retirement party for uh, Tony and Sarah. So we're going to do some extra things during the service. And, uh, and so what we're asking actually is for you to be prepared to stay after a little bit. Um, and uh, there's an announcement in your e-bulletin that you can check out. But we're going to stay after and have some food. And then uh, as well, we are hoping to present them with a... Um, a photo book, and so we're asking, polling everybody, if you have old pictures or just even recent pictures of, of events or things uh, with Tony or Sarah, uh, we'd love for you to uh, send them in to paulacherveny at gmail.com. So I'll just spell that Paula, P A U L A C E R V E N Y. So if you have any memories, things that, uh, you know, Whatever you have, uh, I'd love for you to send them in. And uh, the full email address is actually, of course, in your e-bulletin, so you can check that. Um, secondly, a small group here is starting uh, September 22nd, Wednesday night. Uh, it's an open group, so if you are looking for a small group, we'd love to invite you to that. We're going to be going through Experiencing God. And, uh, and then from there, what we're hoping to do is uh, begin to create more small groups uh, moving out of that, uh, moving forward. So... Um, as well, a couple other things that are happening. We are doing a baptism Sunday on the 19th, baptism and dedication. And so uh, if you are still last minute wanting to be baptized, uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you and, and arrange that. As well, uh, we, sorry, I am running alongside with a few other guys, uh, a group called Intentional Father, The Intentional Father. And we're going to be working through a book once a month. And uh, it's, uh, it's really like a study and, some, and it's discussion. There's some video. And we're going to meet once a month on uh, the first Tuesday of every month. So October 5th, uh, Tuesday, 730. We're going to meet here. And it's going to be a time for dads. It's for 
for fathers, grandfathers, or, uh, or anybody that's mentoring other people, discipling. It's going to be uh, involved just how to give your life away. We're going to talk about what it means to be a dad, what it means to be a man. And uh, in our culture, obviously, that's a, a pressing question. And uh, so we're going to talk about that, support each other, and uh, think about what it looks like to be, uh, to raise sons of courage and character. And so I invite you to check that in your e-bulletin as well. You can sign up for that online uh, or show up, but I'd love for you to sign up so I can know uh, if I should order some books for you when you come. So it's 20 bucks for a book when you come. Uh, two other things. Uh, Josh and Rebecca are having a um, wedding, a, sorry, wedding, a baby shower this afternoon, 1 to 4 p.m. And so if you have bought something or planning to come, we'll see you there. Otherwise, you're welcome to come and celebrate with them. Um, uh, so one o'clock to four o'clock here at the church. And then lastly, we want to just remind you that if you're giving this morning, you can do that uh, through the website. You can e-transfer to giving at igrace.ca or you can come in person uh, and even through the week 12, uh, sorry, nine to nine to one, uh, Tuesday to Friday, we're here and the office is open. Awesome. I think I got through that all. I'd love for you to uh, take a moment and pray with me. We're going to open up God's Word and, uh, and jump into the Psalms again this morning. Uh, we're going to uh, do uh, a week on baptism next week. Uh, and then the week after, we're going to do one more psalm, a summer psalm. And it, it will really actually be the, the fall, the 26th of September. But uh, after that, in, in October, we are going to be launching uh, a new series called The Promises of God. And uh, so we'll look at that coming forward. So just uh, perk your curiosity for that. So why don't we pray? Father, this morning, uh, we just are so uh, needing your grace, Lord. So needing your word, your instruction. Uh, in a busy world, Lord, we are seeking to live in your peace and in your rest. And so I pray for each person watching this morning that you would instruct us, lead us, uh, out of the old and into the new, that you'd take us one step closer, Lord, one step deeper. Lord, open our eyes to see you. Help us to have humble and, uh, and, and learning hearts, Lord, before you, God. So I pray, Lord, you bless your word uh, and you give us ears to hear in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to begin this morning by getting you to listen to something. So... If you're listening right now, you'll hear it starting to play. And I want you to uh, see if you know the song. Some of you may know it. And uh, this song actually was all over social media a while ago. But uh, what you're hearing right now, what you're listening to, is actually a fully authenticated recording of the sound of European pilgrims at one of their annual festival celebrations. Yes, European pilgrims. This had been a rare, previously undistributed version uh, of them, and what they're doing is they're giving thanks to God uh, before uh, they eat. And not only that, but we also have a photo that was taken at what may have been the same gathering, so hopefully you can see that now. Now, if you're confused, of course, this is not the Christopher Columbus. I'm not talking about the Christopher Columbus kind of pilgrims. Of course, 1620 uh, did not have any kind of recording technology. No, this is a different kind of European pilgrim. This is the sound of my mom's whole side of the family, myself included. Uh, a, a group of 40 plus pilgrims of mostly European descent from all over Canada gathered to singing grace and, and giving praise before they eat their evening meal. Uh, four generations of omas and papas, aunts and uncles, siblings, cousins, who have faithfully trekked from their homes three times, three separate times a year to celebrate the high points that mark our family calendar. For our tribe, and maybe you have a similar uh, situation, we meet at Thanksgiving, we meet at Christmas, and then we meet in the summer at something we call Cliff House. And three times a year, we sing this song together. We sing the song, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Now, this recording that you heard from, from, from Cliff House uh, marks the glorious last week for us of August, where everyone from, I mean, now we're right across Canada, even the States, making our pilgrimage to a cottage compound on a stunning lake uh, in Muskoka, just north of Bracebridge. And we come together uh, for 10 days, or sorry, just over a week, 10 days every year. And this is actually, this last week marked our 24th year in pilgrimage. And as a family, we are pilgrims. 
And what we do before every meal, no matter if it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, or the week that we spend together at Cliff House, no matter the season, is we sing this song together and we pray and give thanks to God as a family. And the reason that we do that uh, is because we recognize and we make a habit of confessing that we're not just any ordinary family. We're not just any ordinary family. Now, when I say that, I don't mean it as a statement of pride, like we're better or more special or, 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 or unordinary, compared or unordinary compared to others, but rather as a statement of thanksgiving because of how deeply our family has been blessed by God. We are recognizing when we sing that we're part of a bigger story. And if you're listening this morning, I want to encourage you to think about your life, not just as your story, but as a, a story that's a part of a bigger story as well. See, what undergirds our family, our family's identity, and what marks our purpose for pilgrimaging together every year is that we aren't just a bunch of people who are being forced to make some sort of appearance at a family reunion. I don't know if you've been there where it's like your wife turns to you and says, we got to go visit our family. And you're thinking, do we have to? Is there another way? Do, could I somehow be otherwise engaged? And we don't just come hoping for turkey in the fall or exchange some gifts in the winter or get some time relaxing by the lake. That's not the purpose of why we come. No, who we are, why we gather, and the reason that we sing is because we are a family that has been blessed and named and called by God. We aren't perfect. We aren't particularly wealthy. We aren't more special. But what we are is people who got a family who God has provided for, who God has prospered, who he has kept, and who we've allowed to build our family on his foundation. See, 45 plus years ago, it was Jesus who called my Oma and my Opa out of this monotony of a life captive to what they would call religious striving and into a new and living relationship with the God of the ages. They had this, this, this encounter with God, this conviction that Jesus was real and was more than what they currently understood. And that realization, as they journeyed towards it, it turned their family and their lives upside down. They found a new kind of living and they never looked back. And it's part of our testimony. It pervades the story of all of our family, a story that's deeper and wider than any of the singular stories in each of our families alone. See, it's interesting because our family does have a lot of really cool stories, lots of incredible uh, individual moments and, and, and legacies. You know, within our family, we, you know, we could tell the story of a ri the rise of a humble janitor uh, all the way to be someone who became the CEO of a large North American, corpor North American corporation. Um, we have stories of the calling of a pastor who left his city and his job to plant a church in the country. If that sounds familiar, that's our story. The story of crazy entrepreneurs in our family who ended up launching a global brand of sportswear. Stories uh, about the emergence of artists, the drive of tradesmen to form companies, the stories of missionaries who were imprisoned for their faith, wild stories of the service of firefighters and policemen in the line of duty, athletes and accountants, tech gurus and salesmen. And each one of them is a captivating story on its own. But those individual stories are all subsumed, are a part of this bigger and wider, more glorious story that we recognize as being told in and through our lives. And so I need you to see that there is something deeper that is happening when we sing. And it is the moment we are recognizing that God's, the God story that we're a part of, not just as, even just as children and grandchildren of Oma and Opa who were called by Jesus, but as the wider adopted children of God who have become members of a new worldwide spiritual family that that spans from creation all the way to new creation. And so when we gather as a family, not a time goes by that we do not sing this song. Someone, it's, it's, it always happens. Every time we sit down to eat, someone raises their voice and leads us. And of course, you know, sometimes it's rote. Sometimes you're distracted. Sometimes it, it feels feeble. Sometimes you just, you know, the kids are thinking this is just a tradition. But none of that reflects anything about this song's meaning and formative power in the life of our family. It's affected us. Now, why am I telling you this? Why, why, why is this song important? 
Well, I tell you all of that because the psalm that we're going to be reading today, the psalm that we're going to read today in chapter 131 of Psalms is also a pilgrim song. It's a song that pilgrims would sing on their journey, one sung for centuries by our ancient Israelite spiritual family. The ones who, like us, were special not because of their moral character or their giftedness, but because they had been called, just like us, and had been blessed by God and wanted to say thank you, wanted to build their life on God. It's part of a group of songs in Psalms, uh, especially put together for this triannual, so three times a year, this pilgrimage that the people of Israel would make from wherever they were in the country, maybe even outside the country, and it's called the, 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 song of, the Songs of Ascent. And if you're in your Bible, you can turn to it, chapter 120 all the way to 134. Each one of them has this, this, you know, this little title. It says, A Song of Ascents. And it's, it's like a little book within the, the, the bigger book of Psalms. Fifteen Psalms that were marked specifically or grouped together to be sung as you set out on this journey Uh, Three times a year by pilgrims in Israel as they made their way from their places where they lived and worked to Jerusalem, to the the capital city, to celebrate the feasts of Passover in the spring, the Feast of Pentecost in the early summer, and then the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. And so they would come together and the families, so they would leave their homes with kids in tow, bikes and coolers probably stacked in their wagon that they're dragging, moms and dads having to slowly move at the pace of the grandparents who are also coming. And then as they walked, what they would do is they would faithfully sing, just as we do every time, faithfully sing these songs, these 15 songs. And then when they were done, you know, maybe an hour later, someone else would sing them again. What else would you do, I guess, for hours and hours of walking? There's no, there's no Walkmans, there's Walkmans. There's, there's no Apple Music, there's no Spotify. And these were the songs that they sang to prepare them and remind them of the bigger story that they were a part of, to leave behind their everyday, ordinary life and step into the bigger story, that that collective experience of being a part of this community, this family of God, recognizing the hope of God that bound them all together, hope of God's deliverance and, and grace. And so the closer that you'd get to Jerusalem, the more people you'd find on the road. You'd, you'd kind of gather together and then they would all, you know, join in singing. Everybody knew the song. It was this shared family thing. A, a, an extended family ascending up the hill of the Lord. And, and Jerusalem really is, is the highest point in all of Israel. And so they, that's why they call it a song of ascent because you're going up the mountain. Now, why is that important for us? Well, Because if, as we'll see today, we as Christians are pilgrims too. We're just like the Christians are pilgrim people. Pilgrims, you know, if if you're thinking, what's a pilgrim? You know, by definition, pilgrims are simply people who spend their life going somewhere. People who spend their life going somewhere. And we're, you know, that's, that's who we are. We've left the, our old ways, our old independence, our sinfulness behind And where are we going? Well, we're following Jesus into the new life that he's calling us. And and then if you're asking yourself, well, how do we get there as Christians? Well, Jesus said, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way forward. And so he's the good shepherd. And so as pilgrims, we're following his way, and we're seeking to align our lives with his, our character, our hope, our source with him. And so as we read the psalm today, I want us to remember that that's the purpose of the psalm. It was a formative remembering and and kind of stepping into this bigger story that God is real and with us and at the center of our lives. So it's one of 15 psalms for the journey that reminds us that our story is more than just ourselves, that our lives are held by God, and that is in him and through him that we are transformed and led. It's what our lives are about. So it's an important kind of psalm. If, you, if you're encouraged this morning, I, I, you know, read through them all 1 to 15. It wouldn't take you very long. It's a cool kind of discipleship journey for, for you this week, maybe in your devotions. So our psalm today in 131 is actually only three verses. And so I want to take a chance just to read you the psalm before, which is only eight verses, so don't worry. 
And I just want you to get a feel because these two Psalms are kind of connected, even though we're really just going to talk about the second. Uh, Because they both end up with this line. They both say this line, O Israel. They kind of climax at this point. They say, O Israel, hope in the Lord. That's their, their encouragement. And so uh, even though they have different functions, it'll be a good comparison for us as we read. So let's read Psalm 130, and then we'll read 131 and see if you can feel the, hear the difference. Psalm 130, a song of ascent, says this, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Psalm 131, a song of ascents. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. I've calmed and I've quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now, I don't know if you felt the difference or you heard the difference, but if we were looking at Psalm 130 and then 131, the first, Psalm 130, is this desperate sort of lament and cry about this, these, this guy or this, these, these people who have been confronted with this internal reality about the depths of their sin and their independence from God. And so, you know, this, it starts and just says, you know, like, God, I'm crying to you from the depths. You know, I've got all this iniquity in my life got this sin that I, I need to deal with. And then, and then the second kind of vision is then, but, if, but you, Lord, are, are faithful, right? With you is forgiveness. And so you end up with this kind of secondary vision of the radical grace and mercy of God. And so then the psalmist is like, okay, I was sinful. And then uh, I, I found, I saw God for who he was. And then the psalmist says, so then I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust you because your love is forever. Your, your hesed is over us and it protects us. And so that love that you have for us is the redemption that we need. That hesed is the good news of future redemption for even the most entrenched sin in my life. And that's a really kind of mo- like in the moment I'm feeling and seeing my own sin. But then Psalm 131 is different. The second psalm is a psalm of confidence. The first is a lament. The second is a psalm of confidence. This is after you've seen the sin, what are you going to do? How are you going to deal with it? How are you going to confront it and work through it? And the whole tone is really one of interdiscipline. And that's what's, a cool, that's what's cool about it is it's an interdiscipline. It's sort of like a chastening. It's a commitment. It's like a, something you'd repeat over and over. And he says, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not going to be raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. It's his confession, his humility, saying, God, you're first, you're greatest. And then he says, but I've calmed and and learned to quiet my soul like a weaned child is my soul within me. And then he says, oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now when speaking about this Psalm 131, these three verses, Charles Spurgeon said, it is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. What he means is that this psalm guides us as pilgrims in the important and often confounding inner work of how we remain in rest, at rest in God. How we remain at rest in God. How not to lose heart in the midst of trials. How to remain clear and focused and at peace in the midst of trouble. How do you do that? How not to, uh, he's showing us how to go about quieting the internal noise that's within. How many of us, if we're listening this morning, could benefit from from some kind of wisdom about that? 
How many of us struggle to remain at rest in God day to day? So I want us to look more closely. See, in verse 2, Psalm 131, David, it says, David has become aware that his soul is noisy. You know, I've got to quiet my soul down. It's, it's, it's noisy inside. He, he said, it's like, uh, I'm like an unweaned baby. <laughs> and I, I remember uh, each of our kids as a dad, you know, I remember this, you know, you know they're, they're, they're tiny and you're holding them. But then all of a sudden, you know, they go from maybe their peaceful, you know, sleep or they're just kind of sitting there all cute and precious and you're kind of, you know, give them a little nose kiss. And all of a sudden, you just touch their face and all of a sudden they start rooting around. They get these like kind of like lips and they go... You know, they're searching. They got a little hunger going on and they're... <laughs> and sometimes, you know, they have their eyes closed and they just look like they're just looking for something to latch onto, like little vacuum cleaners hoping to find something to suck. And uh, when all of a sudden when they do that, you know that you've got a time limit. They've got about 30 seconds, maybe a minute before they start losing it. You can give them a mint, you can give them a soother. You can even kind of like stick your little pinky finger in there just to kind of give them something to, to, to chew on. But if you wait any longer than that, they, they, they will blow up. And uh, the other thing you can do is, you know, I've tried a couple times, it's just kind of, you know, I'm sitting there and holding them, just see if they're, they're kind of like chomping at my chest. And when they realize that you don't have the equipment, it gets noisy really fast. And if you're a mom, you know that as well. If they catch just the scent of, of, of milk, they, they don't want to sit still anymore. They go hunting. And that's David's assessment of his soul. He's just saying, like, inside, I'm just like, I'm searching. I'm unable to find peace. I'm looking for the thing that's going to relieve the pressure. Unable to, to actually slow down or in need of something to pacify. And all he can find are things that don't ultimately satisfy him. Saying, that's my soul's just, it's, it's just roiling inside. And maybe you're aware of the inner noise. Or maybe, I guess just to ask, are you aware of the inner noise of your soul? Are you aware of the lack of calm that exists within you day to day? Maybe you're just so used to it, it just feels normal. Um, last week when I made my pilgrimage up north to, to Cliff House with our family, I had read something really helpful before I left that I wanted to just implement. And I, I, I mean, I practiced this in some ways all the time, but it just was really great information, really great encouragement. And the challenge that I read was that when you go away, especially on a vacation, claim a spot where you're going to meet God each day. Name that place and just say, that's my, my, that's my altar. That's the sacred space, the meeting place where I'm going to make it holy or set it aside for God. And uh, so when I went up to the, to the cottage, I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, there's one place that came to mind, and it's the Muskoka chair that's at the end of the dock, uh, you know, kind of, it's, it's sort of like an extended pier, so you're really sort of out in the middle of the water. And uh, I spent 20 to 30 minutes every morning just, just out there by myself. And, you know, I don't know what you imagine, someone doing it there, you got their Bible, you're writing notes, but really I just... All I did was I got quiet and I just tried to pay attention to the noise inside me. <laughs> the unanswered questions. It's just trying to, to quiet down just the, 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 everything around me and, and think about the unanswered questions, the burdens, the fears that were, that were talking, the ambition that was kind of moving around, the hopes, the judgments, the longings that I have. They're all speaking. And I just sat there and I didn't allow myself to ignore them or avoid them. Because that's often what we do. It's just we're too busy to deal with them. And I, I, I you know, because I'm a pilgrim and I know that in my life I've got to get somewhere. I'm going somewhere with God. God's leading me into, into deeper reality with him. And what often gets in my way that I'm just, I don't often have time for it or I, or I devalue it is the noise and the urgency of life is actually what keeps me off track. It's like I can't hear God's voice because my soul is just a cacophony of noise. And I need to figure out how to quiet it. And so if you were quiet enough to listen this morning, how noisy would your soul be? What, are the, what is the noise going on inside of you? Do you know where it comes from? See, it, it may, 
Internally, it may sound or feel like anxiousness or fear. It might feel like worries that kind of beset you. Maybe, it, maybe it's the, the failure that kind of keeps raising its head or its voice. Maybe it's busyness or ambitions or unmet longing. But David's answer in our psalm is that all of the noise of our souls, all of the cacophony within us actually originates, his, his, his point is it originates from one source, which is actually really helpful. And what he labels it is he says, this is the noise within you is it comes from a proud self-will. It's our pride and our independence that makes our souls noisy. To illustrate that very point with the psalm, one author wrote uh, his version of the same psalm. He calls it his anti-psalm. So he just the psalm in, in its kind of opposite contrast. And he begins by saying, you know, verse one, not O Lord, but he says, O self. He says, my heart is proud. My eyes do look down on others. All the time I chase after things too great and too difficult for me. So of course I'm noisy and restless inside. It comes naturally like a hungry infant fussing on its mother's lap. Like a hungry infant, I'm restless with my demands and my worries. And I scatter my hopes on anything and everybody all the time. And so what David is explaining in, in, in this psalm is really three different ways in which pride makes our souls noisy. And, in, and when our souls are noisy, it distracts us from actually following God. So it's his callback. He says, if you're going to pilgrim towards the truth, if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to set your gaze on him, you can't do it with a noisy soul. So how does pride affect us? He gives us three ways. Verse 1 the first part of verse one, he says, pride affects us by our hearts being lifted up. So how, does our, how do our hearts get lifted up? Well, we've all probably at points laid down our life, our, our, our confession, say, God, okay, you, you have first place. But it comes back, pride creeps back in, but not always obviously. It's not always obvious to us. And that's the insidiousness, the insidious nature of pride. It's why it's so dangerous. Pride is confusing for most of us to locate because we label it either as self-confidence, positively as self-confidence, or positively as humility. And I don't know how, you, you know, you're probably thinking, how does humility and pride go together? There's nothing wrong, of course, with self-confidence. And of course, there's nothing wrong with humility. It's, it's, it's a virtue. But what pride does is it corrupts both of them. And we end up thinking we have confidence and thinking we're humble when really it's pride at work. And what pride does is it turns our healthy confidence into unhealthy independence, self, self-sustaining, you know, mindsets. And then what, as well, pride takes humility and turns it into an inner identity built on shame or fear or timidness. Eugene Peterson says it this way, he says that in our present culture, This is what the world calls us or or beckons us or invites us to do. We're first incited into this idea of being grandiose, of being better, of being the best, of achieving. And then when we fail, we're then intimidated into just being infantile. So those are our options in our culture. Is David's insight is that pride is not only at the root of every ambition that we entertain apart from God, it's also at the root of the shame and the fear that we settle and live in. Thinking we can live our lives according to our own wisdom and capacity, we either believe the lie that we're more than we are, or we believe the lie that we're less than we are. Scripture tells us, it says that pride puffs up. It, it inflates us. <laughs> and we're probably aware of that sort of experience with other people. You meet someone and you can just tell they've got this grand sense of themselves. But I want to just flesh that out a little bit. When it says pride puffs up, it helps us to think about what a proud heart looks like. Not as like a home that's comfy with carpets and couches, but it says a heart that's prideful is like a massive and empty hall with stone floors and hard walls. Pride makes your heart into a big noisy room. And inside, the reason it's noisy is because it's constantly echoing both the loud inner boasts of your ambitions and also the fearful cries of your unmet needs. And those things are just rolling around inside your heart is this desire to be great, and at the same time, the fears that maybe I'm not. 
or the failures. Either way, if your heart is noisy, restless, or fearful, David says you should start by addressing your pride and thinking about how maybe pride is at work in your heart in those two ways. Now the second part of the verse, it tells us not only does pride puff up and make us noisy inside, but it adds this phrase, it says our eyes are raised too high, which is another way of saying I look down on people. Pride makes me end up looking down on others. Pride leads me into arrogance in my relationships. Pride affects my vantage point of how I see others. It makes me also, pride makes you deeply insecure. And I know that sounds contrary, but that's how pride works. It makes you insecure. It means that internally, even if I can honestly say that I love someone, I'm also continually as well remembering or hunting for ways in which I can justify that if I was to measure up against them, that somehow I'd be superior. We're always measuring, and that's what pride does. It's competitive. We're never at rest, always competing and wrestling for position with others, even if we never say it out loud, even if no one ever knows this is how we think or feel. I remember uh, one of our friends was telling us about how one of the things that God did in her life was that she used to have this inner critic, this inner judgment, that when she walked in somewhere, she would, she would immediately judge herself against other people in the room. She'd, she'd find things that either she was lesser or more than. And that was always the internal work that was happening in her heart. And the problem with pride is that it warps our ability to have healthy and open relationships with them. Imagine you're trying to really love someone and you're, and you're still trying to justify yourself in light of them. Somehow what they think or say means more to you than what you think about yourself. We become preoccupied in our pride this is what happens. You become preoccupied with your performance. You become preoccupied uh, with how others feel, so you become easily offended by them. You become preoccupied with what others think, and so be, you become envious of them. You become preoccupied with the performance of others, so you become timid because you don't compare. You become preoccupied with how others think, and so you grumble against them, or you become critical. And then David adds one other thing just on top of it, which I think is really important. He adds this third phrase. He's, first he says, my heart's not lifted up. My eyes aren't raised too high. And then he says, I don't occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. If you're going to pilgrim to God, you've got to make sure that you're not occupying yourself with things too great and marvelous. Well, what does that mean? What he's saying is that if you want to quiet your soul, you must be aware of the very real temptation that ambition has become in our culture, in his culture, in every culture. But let's look at it for a moment in ours. Ambition is raging in our culture. It's, it's, it's celebrated. And in, at the heart of ambition is pride. Now, I probably need to separate the difference between godly ambition, which the Bible talks about, or another way of saying that would be aspiration or healthy aspirations, and contrast that with ungodly ambition. Now, the way to separate them out just really simply is that the goal of godly ambition is that you would give your best, that you would give your all to please God in your life. That's at the root of everything is that you're trying to please and live for God. And so you're doing that with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength, you know, everything you have for God. Working hard, being faithful, having good character, loving others, taking responsibility, that's all part of godly ambition. And we uh, cheer for that. That's part of what it means to be uh, someone who follows Jesus. But contrast that and it's, it's, a, it's kind of a thin line, but ungodly ambition is just a complete, just a, just a shift of focus. It's that you give everything, you give your best. It sounds familiar. Okay, it's okay to give your best. But you give your best to attain something as opposed to pleasing God. To probably please yourself or, or attain some goal that you've set out as something worthy. And the Bible has a name for that, even if it's something good. It says, that's what idolatry is. Idolatry or worshiping an idol is simply something that has more value to you or more worth or more glory, more importance than God. And that's the very first of the Ten Commandments, that you have no other strange gods before God. 
right? And that's what our culture struggles with, is it doesn't want to put God's first, God first. And so it puts all these other things in front of him. And in doing so, our lives are warped. Now, don't imagine for a second, just as you're thinking about your ambition, and maybe you're thinking, I'm not that ambitious. I don't struggle with that. Don't for a second imagine that your current success or your wealth or your drive, or your social standing is a measuring stick of your inner ambition. And this is what we fool ourselves about. We think, I don't struggle with ambition, because obviously I haven't attained to all these things, therefore it must not be a problem in my life. But that's a fallacy that, there's a fallacy that only successful people are plagued by ambition. It's not true. David is saying you can discover ambition at work in your life as much in the regrets and the insecurities that, you've, that you hold on to in your life, as much as you can find them in the ruthlessness or competitive nature that you can more overtly see. Peterson, Eugene Peterson, uh, I, I quoted him before, he notes as well that when an ancient temptation, this is what he says, an ancient temptation or a trial that we were meant to overcome, like ambition, right? It's not a virtue, it's a vice, becomes an approved, when that becomes an approved feature in a, in a culture, when people say, that's good, that's a good thing. A way of life that's expected and encouraged. He says, in that moment, Christians have a stumbling block put before them that is hard to recognize for what it is. And we have to be careful. For it has been made in our culture into a monument. It's been gilded with bronze and bathed in decorative lights, he says. Ambition, he says, has become an object of veneration. Right? We worship those who have the greatest ambition. Right? Even if it's not cutthroat ambition, it's just to be the best person that you can be. That's worshipped in our culture. That's a good ambition. But he's coming along saying, watch out, because at that very place, anything before God is, is subject to pride, to lead you into pride. The plain fact, he says, is that right in the middle, that that object of veneration is right in the middle of the road of faith. It obstructs our discipleship, he says. He says, for all of its fancy dress and honored position, it is still a stumbling block. So with all of that exposed, and we're closing now, what do we do then? It's only three verses. How do we deal with our pride that makes our hearts noisy, that keeps us from strong, healthy relationships with the people that we're supposed to love, that doesn't lead us into competing and, 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 and worshiping other things other than God. How do we deal with our pride? It's, it's obviously dangerous. Well, we're learn, David tells us, we're to learn to quiet, learn that in order to quiet our souls, we have to become quiet just to listen to our souls. We have to become aware of pride in all of its manifestations. You're probably going to get hoodwinked by pride if you're not listening for it, if you're not allowing your soul to get quiet. And then he says, but then part two is, you know, not just listening for the pride. He says, he calls us to learn then to reassert the truth. He says, you've got to wean yourself out of that pride. So David said he's teaching us then to, to speak the truth to our souls. That's why he says, oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. It's, it's a reminder that, hey, don't lift up your soul. Don't raise your eyes too high. Don't look down on others. Don't let ambition grab hold of you. You can't sing this song honestly if you're not paying attention. He calls us to learn to reassert the truth. He's teaching us to speak the truth to our souls, to sing the truth to our souls, to sing it really to one another as we walk as pilgrims on the path together. He's saying... More often than you think, you need to go and ascend and, and, and worship together. Not angrily and, and, and speak to one another. Not angrily or with fear, or with disappointment or shame in our tone about the pride that we have. But with the tender patience of a mother weaning her child. You've got to speak the truth to yourself like a mother who's trying to comfort her child. As he's learning to let go of the fear and the constant need that used to, you know, work in his life. Calling her child to trust that what seems pressing now, the, the, the franticness that exists and cacophony of noise in our soul, that what feels scary right now is not outside of or, or unnormal. 
or irregular for what God's leading us into, for her care and wisdom of what's best for us. And this is David's encouragement. He, he tells us to say, be still, my soul. Be at rest within me. To remind ourselves that our work is not to solve the problem that we're facing. We, don't, we can't solve it on our own. Our purpose, just speak to your soul. Your purpose, remember. I, just, I say it to myself, remember, Mike. Your purpose is not to make something of yourself so you can feel justified in the eyes of others or even yourself. That's not your job. Your resources, Mike, are not limited in this situation. God's with you. This problem that you're facing that feels like the end of the road isn't the end of the road. Your safety and your future in this moment are not in jeopardy. You are held in the arms of God. Be still, my raging soul. Be still. You're not alone. Be still and remember that the Lord is with you and he cares for you. Be still and wait. Just wait. Hope in the Lord today. Hope in the Lord tomorrow. Keep hoping in the Lord because he reigns over all from beginning and forever. And he's calling us. Would you sing that kind of song together? Would you praise God from whom all blessings flow? Would you praise him, all creatures here below? Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Holy Ghost. He's calling us to sing that song. And so this, this morning, really all I want to do is I want to lay that before you and, and just pray with you that this week, you know, you'd claim a spot, you'd claim a, a chair or a porch, claim the 30 minutes in the car, claim that 20 minutes at the end of the day when you're just on the couch and get quiet enough to hear the noise and then speak to your soul about the hope of heaven. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord now and forevermore. So let's pray. Father, this morning, we just recognize, we just recognize that so often our souls are are, are just noisy within us. So often we feel not at rest in and, and, and living apart from the peace that you offer us. So I pray that you teach us, Lord, how to quiet our souls, how to listen, how to make space, Lord, for the anxieties and allow them to rise up within us, the questions, the needs. And I pray that you'd, as we, as we allow those just, to, just to, 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 to have their voice, Lord, within us, that we'd then be able to, to speak the truth to ourselves. I pray, Lord, that just even this morning that your peace would come upon your people, that they'd be reminded and encouraged that as they walk this pilgrim's path, as they seek you, as you're the first place in their life, Lord, that you'd bless them with your peace, that the peace of God that transcends all understanding would guard their hearts and their minds, that you'd lead them into your rest. In your name, Jesus, we pray this together. Amen.